Well, hello, everybody. I'm David Morris, publisher for Lake Drive Books, and I'm joined today by my uh, esteemed colleague, friend, uh, publishing professional and editor extraordinaire, Mick Silva. How you doing, Mick? Thank you. Good. Good, Good to see you. And I see you're here with your cat, I believe. I am. Right next she's to you. Crazy. Can we she's see the cat happy. for a second? Is that okay? Yeah. yeah Make an appearance. There she is. Our bangle. And her name is? Uh, Samus. Samus. After, oh, yeah. You're going to have to remind me of the names from? From from the video game Metroid. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Going way back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mick, Mick still plays video games with his daughters. I don't, although I wish I would. And <laughs> it sounds like fun. Um, and uh, we are here today to... Uh, not interview Mick necessarily, although I want to hear from Mick, but interview <laughs> interview me, the publisher, David. Um, this is something that I've done with all the other authors, and um, you know, it's been a great way to uh, just get get content up there, and we can excerpt it, and uh, it gives people a chance to meet the author. That's the main thing, and um, it's it's been fun to do these videos. We put them up on YouTube. But I also am an author, and my book is also available, yeah. Lake Drive Books. My book, Lost Faith and Wandering Souls, A Psychology of Disillusionment, Mourning, and the Return of Hope. And uh, this, this was very much a life work for me, um, and it, it relied a lot on my history as a uh, religious studies scholar, to be honest, uh, and studying in psychology and religion. Um, but that's the book, and it, it's been fun to get it out there, and people are checking it out, and I hope you'll check it out if you're watching this. What did you think? Tell, tell us about yourself, Mick, first, and yeah, yeah, I'd yeah. love to hear what you think about um, the book. Well, I have my copy here, and I loved it. I feel like, uh, you know, I got a I got an advanced release because I asked, I asked you for it uh, early on. We were working together at Zondervan. Um, but I still say it to this day, you were the best boss I ever had. Um, uh -huh. Zondra Publishing. I was there, what, three years, I guess, um, following a stint at Waterbrook uh, when Multnomah came on board over there at about 2010, right around there when I was there. I've been a freelance editor for a long time now, about 13 years, um, editing for just over 22 at this point. Um, but yeah, it's been roundabout. I mean, if you're in Christian publishing, you start in, you know, one of the meccas, either uh, Nash Vegas, as we call it, or uh, Colorado Springs. Um, and I started in Colorado Springs. So, and I hadn't been to Grand Rapids yet. So I was very glad to get to come to. to yeah. Zon There's also the Midwest, whether it's Chicago right. or Grand Rapids. Yeah. Chicago and Grand Rapids. And so, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm learning this. I'm, I'm checking them off, you know, as, as I go. Um <laughs> But yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun just kind of like getting the lay of the land out here because I always felt like West Coast was was where I was uh, sort of born and raised and didn't really know much about uh, publishing uh, as far as like the bigger bigger world and church community I should say too. So real quick, just, uh, real quick as a as an editor, you're you're like a, a book doctor, a developmental editor. I am now an yeah. author coach, a writing coach. Yep. Yeah, it, I am now. Um, started in kind of development and acquisitions and then um, kind of have transferred more into like coaching and book doctoring. Yeah. Um, and and that's just been, I mean, <laughs> it was sort of the luck of the draw at, at the beginning when I got an assistant editorship somewhere and I just enjoyed the development process so much. Um, acquiring is more the business side of it, as you know, and it's like, you know, that I, I can wear that hat, but it's not as comfortable as you know, um, doing this way, which is more of a conversation and the dialogue with the author and then talking about their background and getting a lot of that story on the page. So, I mean, one of the natural, I guess, connection points to this book uh, was that the second half is all about memoir. And that's what I love to work on. Mm. It's personal stories and and what people have, have experienced, particularly their faith journey. And so um, just like seeing that you had had done your doctoral studies on this um, was just like, I mean, it was the the icing on the cake for me when mm -hmm. I came to Zondra and I was like, oh my gosh, he's, he's into what I'm into. And, yeah. you know, we probably have some really cool discussions. So I've just been excited to have this conversation for a long time. Same. So, yeah. Same. Um, Thanks for being an early reader. It's oh, yeah. Always, it's no. always encouraged me. Thank you. So excited about it. 
Um, and just the fact that you have it out, I think is, is so helpful to people to, I think just anyone coming to it is going to see that it's, it's a lot to get into. So, it, mm. you know, there's kind of an upload process that has to happen. I've had to read it pretty slowly. Yeah. Even then I had to kind of come back to it and go, okay, some of the, the, I guess, progenitors of the thinking, you know, the psychology, whether that's from Freud yep. to Klein to- I got a lot know. of Freud books right over there. People don't know. <laughs> I keep them off to the side, hidden, so it doesn't freak you yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and so many people don't, I mean, they know Freud, but they don't know the other names of, of the people who have right. um, charted out this territory. Um you know, and particularly Christians, like, you know, Mark Knoll's book, The the Evangelical Mind. Um, Candle of the Evangelical Mind. Yeah. yeah. I feel a little bit implicated there because I just don't know these names. Um, I mean, and, and if you can, like, quickly, I don't know if you can summarize the first half, but it's it's basically the, the idea that from Freud, we get the, the early psychology of faith, and then we go to, to kind of Klein with Bowlby as well. I think you mm -hmm. cover Winnicott, Morning Theory there, Erickson, yeah. mm -hmm. a lot of these kind of like early um, scholars. Um, I don't know if you can like give us the lay of the land with with how maybe just the subtitle, how this is a psychology, psychology of disillusionment, mourning, right. interrupt. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think a simple way to talk about this concept is that it is psychosocial okay and i get that word mostly from the psychoanalyst of the 50s 60s and 70s eric erickson who's very popular at the time uh had his book childhood in society he was a child psychoanalyst in particular but he was also someone that would look at history and uh society and how that impacts the individual and how the individual responds psychologically and so that's why he has books actually on martin luther you know, he has that book, Young Man Luther, and he's got a book on a whole biography on Gandhi, big, thick biography on Gandhi. Right. Um, and um, so so what I try to do in the book first is situate us religiously in a social historical context. I don't know how great I do that. I do a lot. I rely a lot on some sociologists at the beginning. You'll you'll recall yep. um, Robert Wethnow in particular was really good. He talks about, uh, and, and, and Wade Clark Roof, this goes back away as a generation of seekers, with no talks about how we've gone from a religion of dwelling to a religion of seeking and practicing. Mm. Um, but, you know, the more I've thought about it over the years too, it's, it's we have sort of a, 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 a spiritual DNA in this country in particular. And I think, I think, the sociology of religion was very uh, liberative for me intellectually because it basically said, it basically helps you understand that your religious life as an, as a, as an individual and your experience of it is so socially determined. That's right. There's so much to it that you had no control over. Right. And you were born into it. Right. And it's just like the water that you, the air that you breathe, and you don't realize that there are other worlds outside. No, right. I mean, you just said it a minute ago. You know, your evangelicalism sort of act, blocked you from experiencing some of this content. That's right. But I think that's true for a lot of us in evangelicalism. There's just this sort of anti-history, anti, unless it's a certain history, anti um, culture, anti-knowledge, anti-science threads that run through evangelicalism. Yes. Um, it's a very hermetically sealed world. And, um, and I think there's a very, very big reason for that. And one of the things I, one of the things I like to go, I don't go into this in the book as much, but lately I've been studying religious history in the United States more. Mm -hmm. And and if you go back to like how we were even started as a nation, we were we were uh, so many of the people who came over and, and we know this story as evangelicals because of religious persecution. Sure. And um, people, would, people came to like the Massachusetts Bay Colony and they started to set up governments that were even somewhat religious oriented. Oh yeah. Um, not necessarily theocratic, um, but it was, it was there, it was in the water. And I've been reading a book on the first great awakening in the 1740s just recently 
there was less than a million people in the United States. And yet this great awakening was in all the newspapers. Yes. And that's part of the reason why it became a great awakening because it was really well promoted and yeah. discussed in print. Uh, if you, if you read this book, it talks about how some of these awakenings happen more where there was actually print publications in circulation, um, you know, put sure. those things together. Yes. Um, but just think about that. There was less than a million people at that time. And now we have 330 million people in the United States. And obviously it's a big mixing bowl of so much, so many other things now. Yeah. But that religious spiritual DNA is so much a part of us. Even if you, you say you weren't brought up evangelical, Methodist, Presbyterian, you still think about things like, am I saved? Heaven and hell, you know, some of the stuff that's not, it's, it's not as the, uh, theologically and scripturally explicit and ground well grounded and you know that's where you get in the whole biblical criticism conversations so long long long-winded response there so far but um that's the main thing we are very socially situated there is a highly co codified language around our our spirituality and our religion and we don't even know it, it it's it's unconscious for a lot of us Mm -hmm. um i mean i've been in situations with evangelicals where you start talking about someone who's not saved and just like people's ears people's eyebrows go up oh did you talk with them did you share the lord with them that's right it, it, you don't even have to actually say it you can see it in the body language that's right um I, it just it just amazes me how how you know there's a there's a whole series on Straight White American Jesus podcast by uh, one of the hosts, co-hosts, Dan Miller, called In the Code. He's up to over 50 episodes, I think. Yeah. Maybe it's more than that. I can't remember. About all the language we use. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's get back to the psychohistory so, or the psychosocial aspect to it. Um, so that's the social thing we're born into. So then how do we respond to it psychologically? And that's where I, I lean, uh, you know, there, there's a, there's a whole growing movement about religious trauma mm -hmm. and, and I, that's not my expertise, uh, but it's basically, it's a, basically a reckoning with the experiences you had and how much they, they rewired you. And right. that's not dissimilar from what I'm saying about how it's in your unconscious. It's, it's mm -hmm. in you. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's very similar, I guess. Um, but the approach I take is uh, is more psychoanalytic, more interpretive, right. um, more socially connected, and theoretically speaking, um, in that what we have to learn how to do is mourn mm. our past. We have to realize we've lost something, mm. and we we aren't going to get it back. And how do we how do we do that process? So I rely really heavily on Freud's paper Morning and Melancholia, which is really provocative because he he talks about uh, melancholy as like numbness and just right. outright depression and cut off and maybe crankiness and maybe even sometimes you can't stop talking about your evangelicalism because you're just so stuck, you right. know. And then mourning is like the work of remembering and processing and feeling the sadness, feeling things. Yes. And it, and if you can do that and move forward, that's that's how you move forward is when you when you can do that part. Yeah, uh, there's transference that's happening from uh, kind of mind to heart there. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. And, and I think just to. Um, kind of, I mean, you have to oversimplify and, and overgeneralize so often in this discussion, but, but, and that's why I love that you, you've done this because you're taking it out of the hands of just academic um, study and putting it into uh, just kind of popular dis, um, discussion. Uh, but evangelicalism as a, as a, um, as part of our DNA, you know, as something that you can't get away from is, is a social construct. It's something that we're, we're continually coming up against in our culture. Right. Whether you're evangelical or not. Right. Now, the more so if you are, if you have identified as uh, as uh, evangelical. Um, so identifying that first off is is key. And I think that's a, a mind kind of thing. That's an intellectual sort of history lesson 
um, like you said, sociology lesson, um, even psychology, just like figuring out how the mind works. So there's a lot of sort of, like I said, uploading to do in the front part of the book. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why I think a lot of times it, it can be off-putting to people. It can be like, okay, well, this is a huge undertaking. I've yeah. really got, you know, slow down my life in order yeah. to take it in. And that's totally understandable. And I think there is, um, there is a time and a place probably for those types of discussions and decisions you have to make but yeah but as we my about, wife says stay away from chapter five that's where all the theory gets really heavy <laughs> my wife would, yeah exactly that's that's where it gets bogged down you know yeah. just a little bit and but i think that it in terms of like a larger discussion of deconstruction like it's just necessary information you have to know how this how this operates right you right. can't deconstruct what you haven't even constructed in the first place so right. you have to like recognize there is a construct and there is a system and it exists in this country, whether you, you know, acknowledge it or not. So let's acknowledge it. And then what do we do about it? And I love that connection you made between like going from that intellectual enterprise largely to the heart issue, yeah. which is to mourn the feeling that you're having. Yeah. Can, can I pause you right there? I, yeah. I think that, that that part of um, of understanding the head part is so key for us. Um and I, and I, it connects to the morning aspect, but it's, it's the remembering part. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we work in publishing and I've had it told to me more than once that, you know, nobody wants to read all this history about evangelicalism. Sure. Yeah. You know, no one wants to, no one wants to know all the detail, but you know what, that's exactly what Evan, what some of us who have left evangelicalism need. We that's need right. to understand how the heck did we get here? And how and we need to sort of excavate that and understand it. And you know, I make the argument that it's it's it is the history, it is the theory that that we so desperately need. One of the memoirs that I study uh, in the book, Kate, uh, Carlene Cross's book, she's the mm -hmm. one that, uh, with a book called Fleeing Fundamentalism, which I'm not sure is totally in print still. Um, and she uh, she was at a Bible college that you've never heard of. Um, and there's a lot of those <laughs> small oh, yeah. Bible colleges you've never heard of married right. to a, a high control abusive husband. Mm -hmm. And she had to break out of this marriage. She had to break out of this environment. And do you know what she did? You remember that perhaps uh, she hid biblical studies books in her closet and read them when no one was looking. You know, that that is just like, OK, you know, it's not just about worshiping differently. It's not about better theology. It's about understanding and excavating. Uh, that's I think I think that can't be underestimated. I'm sorry I interrupted. No, you. absolutely. I, I, I love the word understanding because you're standing under the history that came before you. And I'm just remembering from my studies in, um, I mean, my evangelical history. I went to Westmont College in Santa Barbara and. Uh, you know, that's where initially my parents had said I lost my faith uh, because I was starting to see some of this biblical studies, comparative mm -hmm. doctrines, um, church history, a lot of stuff there that was very much in the evangelical tradition. All right, wait well. a minute. Your parents told you that's where you lost yeah. your faith? Oh, yeah. All right. This is interesting. You're right. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, I mean, I was I was being protected all up to that point. And then when I got to this liberal arts Christian college, boy, that was that was yeah. where it was, it was all bets are off and maybe he's going to totally lose his yeah. faith. We Which deserve. is anything but a bastion of liberalism. Anything but. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, there was like, <laughs> there's no cohabitation of, of dwarves or anything. I mean, it was chapel three times a week. So, um, and yet it has this reputation because of, I think, some of the assumptions that have just been baked in, um, you know, and it, it, so, I mean, my point about that being, though, that, that deconstruction, as you hear about it in the news today, is being sidelined in the same way. I mean, at least in the hard right um, and, and fundamentalist uh, sort of language. So getting language for what you stand under, what you need to understand in your background is absolutely primary. Mm -hmm. You know, and I just didn't have that yet. Um, and when I got it at Westmont, boy, that was, I was dangerous, you know, or I was told it was dangerous. And of course that for someone like me just made me want to investigate more. So, you know, all of that is is just kind of water under the bridge to coming to this book and going, oh my gosh, it's all here in one place. Mm -hmm. And I can read about it and I can um, understand it. You know, I don't just have to like bump into it and 
read it in the dark in the secret, you know, in my closet mm. or whatever, I can, I can actually say, Hey, here's, here's what actually has happened mm. in our history collectively. Yeah. You know, let's, let's reckon with it. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was a lot of fun. And then jumping to the memoirs, the second part of the book, where you kind of, you break down, you mentioned one, but um, I mean, my favorite, oh my gosh, The House Where the Hardest Things Happen, Kate Cayley's book. I have recommended that book to so many people. It's short, it's it's artful, it's really well done, I mean, in terms of me uh, memoir, but the content of it, I mean, when you talk about the the psychology of disillusionment, she just, she breaks it all down in that book, I feel like, and just through, the through story. Yeah, you're right. The overview of her story basically is that she was uh, excommunicated from, or her mom was excommunicated from their church uh, when she was young, and she lost her faith community. This this warm, caring, um, comforting place that she knew as home was just ripped out from under her, and so she has to kind of come to terms with that and the religious system um, that caused that, but also what what does she do now and and work through the mourning uh, that you were exactly talking about um in the first part of the book so to me that was just it was very formative and it helped me understand the experience of what you're you're talking about where you go from the intellectual understanding sort of that training part and then start applying it to your actual experience and how do i learn this right how do i how do i overcome now rather than just understand yeah yeah her yeah. story in particular was fascinating because the loss of faith happened when she was five or six or seven years old right right um i mean the the sort of falling out of faith um that happened because her mother uh her father was having some uh, medical issues and her mother had to take a job at a restaurant while well, the restaurant was a place that served alcohol that's right yes the church they were going to in believe it or not the rural new england uh turned their backs on them and, and mm. excommunicated them and and you know, even as a little child looking, you know, as, as an adult writer, looking back, she realized she was depressed as a little kid and it was over matters of spirituality and society in a way too. Right. It's like social, social glue. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's a particular yeah, loss of friendship, loss of um, yeah. family really. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that is a beautiful book and that it, it really gets at the, significance of the feelings and mm -hmm. the hurt and the mm -hmm. bewilderment um it gets at that 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 word lost faith the title it gets at the title lost faith and wandering souls yes exactly you know, we've lost something and we're wandering mm -hmm. there's this listlessness this this wandering this there is there is a fair amount of seeking as the book progresses and an active hope for making something happen but it really begins with some hard parts really hard parts even as an right. adult kate asking her mother you know why did you let those people treat you like that right which yeah. for her in a way it was kind of healthy because she's opening up the conversation that's right yeah 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 and you talk about um as you lead up to that section of the book how we do need to make this transference each of us you know from the intellectual knowledge that we now have mm. to applying it to our own experience. And I find that that's where the deconstruction process for me is just, I mean, it, there's so much value in understanding this, that, that you do have to go through that transference. It's not, no longer just this thing that you were taught or, or that you, you had to take in as religious precepts, maybe. Um, that I think a lot of Christians feel this, uh, that they're um, obligated largely to uh, understand the precepts of their faith and and use doctrine basically yeah. as the glue that yeah. attaches them to this community, even yeah. though at the same time you might be talking about experiential faith or yeah. uh, relationship that it's all about a personal relationship and yet you don't have a personal relationship. Right. What you have are precepts and and right. concepts, and it's not even applied to your real life. So just being able to see in the second part of this book all of these people who are now orienting themselves to their own experience of faith. Right. It's so instructive. And, and I think that's one of the reasons I love the book is because it's not just, just the half of, of a book. It's two parts, uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's the intellectual yeah. part. It's the, the understanding yeah. part. That's really good. Yes. Yeah. How do you overcome this? And here's some examples. You say like, 
transferring it onto our own experience and going into the deconstruction process, the way I've heard there, there's a there's a, like a there's a few layers to that deconstruction deconstruction word de sure. truth deconstruction, but I think the one thing a lot of, and a lot of it is sort of like taking it apart, you know, like and it's that intellectual part. Yeah, yeah. the word almost kind of summarizes what we're talking about here. So there's that deconstructing. There's that, but I've also heard it in an emotional aspect. Mm. Oh, I'm. I, I heard someone say the other day, "Oh, I'm deconstructing all over again." You know, you're 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 feeling this sense of um, like a tailspin. You know? Yeah, yeah. You're it, you're it's a you're downward up. spiral. Like I'm, my worldview is blowing up all over again. Right. And I don't know who I am. I don't know where I am. Yeah. I don't know what to do disorienting yes. disorienting yeah 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 that and that's that is an emotional journey it is it's a social journey it's a loneliness journey um yeah. but it is it is it is emotional whether you experience it very quickly or over extended period of time or whether yeah. or whether you even experience it more than once like hmm. this person i just referenced and and i and for me it happened even uh, yeah. twice i would say right once was in my in my younger adult years and that's why i spent a lot of the book kind of trying that's why i that's why i studied this stuff <laughs> yes <laughs> i right. understand it and right. i thought i understood it and then i reached a new point in my life journey where a, some things imploded and yeah. you know one of them particularly had to do with uh the the church that my wife and i are going to and they're um, their utter lack of inclusivity for the queer community. I mean, they say they're welcome, but they're not really welcome. None of them actually feel welcome. Sure. Yep. Um, for for a number of very specific reasons, but just in general, right? As well. And I, I, we were just like, okay, that's it. That's that's not us. We can't be a part of that. And then and then I felt it all over again. Mm -hmm. And I, and here I was, this person who I thought I understood from a psychological basis what how to get through this and what to do, sure. and how to grow up and spiritually grow and, and mature and be more mature. Well, I got sucked in. So, 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 so socially speaking. Yeah. Not sociological speaking, socially speaking. And um, yeah, I hadn't realized it too, I think. And, and yeah. made different, in, in a sense, made some mistakes in a way that I shouldn't have. Yeah. Maybe I needed to know that better. Maybe it's something I need to write into this book now. <laughs> Maybe that's, yeah, um, that's, that's part two. Yeah. 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 I think that's a really common thing, though. Not just that churches aren't as uh, inclusive as they like to purport, but but that uh, there's there's another part of the path that you need to walk and you just didn't didn't realize it or you didn't didn't um, right. recognize it before until something comes up and sort of forces you out of the nest, so to speak. Yeah, right. There is this idea that you know, once we kind of move beyond evangelicalism or even beyond Christianity, that well, we're, we're done. We did it. Yeah, we took we care of it. it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, so. I think I I think there's something I think there's something to that. I think that in a way, you can't let yourself perseverate forever because mm -hmm. it's not fair to you or the people around you. Um, but on the other hand, it's no small task. Um, and, and getting back to Freud, he had this phrase of the mourning process as being painstakingly slow. Right. And I, I have this other, I had one of my, dis, my dissertation chair um, in grad school, he was Dutch and um, psychiatrist. He had the complete works of Freud in his office in English and German. And <laughs> <laughs> um, um he he talked about how and he loved language. He talked about language a lot. He would talk about how when you when you come from another country to another country, different language spoken. If you do it before a certain time in your life, like before you're 20, mm. you can lose the accent. Sure. But if you do it after that time, you never lose the accent. Wow. And I think for us who grew up steeped in evangelicalism, you never really lose. Yeah. It's always you never tainted. really lose it. It's yeah. still your brain is still wired that way. You might call things differently, but you're still doing the same thing psychologically speaking. That's right. Yeah. Um, and it's gonna be a lifelong journey. That's why it's that's why that word mourning is so provocative. Yeah, and and I love how mourning too. I mean, even just working on Kate Meyer's book, um, 
which is called faith uh, doesn't mean doesn't erase grief doesn't erase grief such a great title and and i think that's to me so instructive i mean the main thing i took from from working on that book was was that uh, grief isn't a once and done process i mean even we think of the steps of grief as being linear yeah. And she very much um, was against that idea that that it's it's more like concentric circles, and you're entering certain circles at certain times, and and you'll go back and forth through, through the different stages, whether that's denial or acceptance or um, even reorienting yourself to the the, the loss. Um, you talk about the objects of loss in and well, and and the the psychologists do um, in the history part of this book, and orienting yourself to that. Um, faith as an object and removing yourself from it and, and recognizing it as, as something that's impacting you as a factor in your life, um, rather than saying, I have to believe certain things so that I have a faith. It's almost like it's a reversal to recognize that you can separate yourself from faith and, and just observe it. Um, yeah. That was one of the greatest things for me was that you gave language to that process, that there is um, a path that I can look at and analyze and say, look, this is what the faith journey looks like. Also, the grief journey has certain landmarks that we can orient ourselves to. And yet it's not a once and done thing. It is a slow, painstaking thing to sort of continually reorient yourself to this, mm -hmm. this journey, this path. Mm -hmm. um, that was so instructive to me. And it, it gave me uh, a larger sense of hope. And I guess I mean, if I had any question for you at the end of all this, it would be like, what is your hope? I mean, you you talk about returning to hope in the subtitle. Do you feel you are able to do that yourself? I mean, is that what you hope your readers will be able to do? Um, mm -hmm. What does that look like? Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, it's hard sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I I think that um, one of the things one of the things that Melanie Klein talks about, she's she's one of the um, you know, object relations school of, of psychoanal psychoanalysis, yes. psychoanalytic theory. She talks about, um, she loves the word pining. Yeah. And um, it, it's like, you, you almost have to um, put yourself in a situation where you can learn, where you, where you can rediscover that feeling of pining. Mm. Um, in, in her case, she's talking about child psychology and, yeah. Uh, children who have issues or as adults they have issues you you have to go you kind of have to go back in time to a point in your life where the world felt alive for you mm -hmm. where you where you found something you could love and sort of um see that again and and get to a space where where you allow yourself to love something i yes. guess for me, it was a blanket when I was about five, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think of Ellie having uh, my oldest daughter having her, her teddy bear, you know? I mean, yeah. And to this day, it's an yeah. object of, of longing. Of yeah. yeah. That's so good. And that, and that's exactly what D.W. Winnicott talks about too. Mm -hmm. Like religion, religious artifacts, religious artifice is actually a transitional object. Mm -hmm. Blanket, corner of a blanket, a teddy bear, Winnie the Pooh. Yes, I love you got to read Winnie the Pooh in life because totally. that's all about that's all about um, creating like a space in between mm -hmm. the uh, the subject and the object and something to be something to be hopeful in uh, yeah. something to pine for. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's, you know, that's I think that's the thing, you know, what is it that what is it that you love? What is it that you used to love and you didn't anymore? What what is it? Where what is it? Where did the world start telling you who you are, and there was a disconnect because you knew you were something different? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you find? And I think that's a big issue for us in the United States, where we're sort of a nation of lost people. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we don't have we don't have that historical grounding. Like if we a lot of us are white Europeans, and so if you look, you know, or if we're not white Europeans, we most of us, unless you're Native American, came from somewhere else. Yeah, right. And so how do you reattach to that? Because it's not just a personal pining for your for something from the past. It's also a collective cultural That's pining. Right. Yeah. And and it, um, Scott Okamoto in his book with Lake Drive Books, uh, Asian American Apostate, 
grew up Japanese American, fourth generation Japanese American, totally lost his sense of identity in the world of evangel white evangelicalism yeah. and reconnected with the Asian American artist community in Southern California. And it was a step in him saying, oh, there's more to life. There's more to me. Yeah. And and the and just the, the sense of camaraderie, you see it there with his yeah. with his friends. Yep. Um, yeah, it was for him music. Yeah. Right? That was a big part of, of yeah. his parenting process. Yeah. I think about, uh, um, yeah, it could be food just as easily. I think of, you know, so many people who yeah, they're either chefs or, the, you know, some of these food travelers, oh, there you go. they're reorienting themselves to their faith. They don't recognize it as such, but traditions um, around food, you know, and community food. Yeah. 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 It's very much that object theory. Um, but again, just, just giving language for that, I think is, is what I hear you saying gives you hope. Um, yeah. Recognizing that there is a, a path here that it has yeah. particular landmarks in it and things that um, you can, you can see as universalizing the experience. Yeah. Just I will not... say, I will say one thing, uh, you know, maybe as we wrap up here and, and a lot of it is figuring out how you can be an active agent mm -hmm. in transformation. Mm -hmm. um, Kate Young Kaylee, going back to that one, one of the, one of the most healing moments of that book that she describes was um two things one was um her daughter saying mom it's going to be okay so her own her own daughter who was the age uh that she was when she went through loss right was was giving her something it's amazing um and she taught that daughter in a sun a subsequent sun, sunday school class mm -hmm. so teaching even your even your own kids the way you raise your kids which is a very big thing among ex evangelicals Oh, yeah. How am I going to now raise my kid? We'll do it. And you're going to find healing in that process. Now, you don't want to work out all your own stuff on your kids, but right. you want to bring them up in a way that's different than what you got. And then you're going to find some healing there. Mm -hmm. And if it's not your, if you don't have kids, there's ways of being involved in the community or even with other people's kids Absolutely. Um, yep. in, in that kind of, in, in that kind of way. So, um, and then, and there was like, um, yeah, and, and speaking of her and other people's kids, there was one kid who hadn't actually hadn't been exposed to Jesus' story, especially of the crucifixion and the resurrection. And there's this one point in her book where she says, where the little kid says, in hearing the, the crucifixion story, you mean they killed him? Mm -hmm. And just that sense of like that fresh, that kid's fresh reaction to that story and the impact it had on Kate seeing her faith in a whole new way and in a very visceral real way yeah authentic way um i mean we were we were we were taught to believe that thing even before we even heard the story you know yeah. i mean we you know we're so over familiar with some of these stories we don't even know what they mean anymore half the time it seems <laughs> i call it oversaved yeah oversaved yeah oversaved. but i think i think you know i mean i i'd love to write my a whole book on Hey, I want to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus, but I don't have nothing to do with most of the Christians I know. And I think I think my way is the right way. I think that would be very healing for me if I could find the time. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That I think my way is the right way. I think that's yeah, all. yeah, yeah. Well, that's very that's very evangelical no? right there. Woo! Yeah, right. <laughs> Let's just dive right into that. Yeah. <laughs> but that's that's just it. It's just like you know, how do you talk about Jesus without being a supernatural theist? Right. You know, maybe there's a lot that Jesus was about that he never said he was God. Yeah, yeah. And, exactly. and, and if you actually, I know there's people who actually make that argument, and they make it well from a sure. historical point of view. It's it's easy to make. Yeah, and, <laughs> and yet so, we never heard it, and we never heard it as an option. So how is that any different than following the Buddha? No, right. Or Taoism. It's it's a philosophy. It's a way. Yes. Um, but we 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 attach all these other things to the Jesus story that we can't even encounter it in That's a true. fresh in a fresh way. In a relational way, in an ethical way. No, it's got to be so soteriological. It's got to be about saving. It's got to be about yeah. the end times. You know. Yeah. So I think I think if we could, if we collectively could reinterpret Christianity in a way that is without so much of that baggage, there's a yeah. lot of there's a lot of work to be done there. It's not the end of. It's not. It, we are not at the end of things. We are at the beginning in that sense. Great. Absolutely. I so agree. And and you reminded me of that question that he asks all followers, you know, who do you say that I am? When you come and you ask a question, a direct question to this mystical rabbi, you're going to get that question back. 
and now you have to go on a journey. Right. right? And to me that, I mean, as mystical or as doctrinal or as practical or relational as you want to make those things. I mean, it's, it's a simple question. Who do you say? And, and you've got to figure that out for yourself. So I really appreciate your book in how it can give language and help me orient myself, help me understand better, and then give me models and, and an example of someone who did try to answer that question. So thank you. Thank you for writing it. Thank you for your work. And I guess just your fortitude in oh, well. going forward and making this your, your life goal. I just, I'm so inspired by it. So and it's my endless joy to get to be your friend as well. So thank you for likewise. It. Thank you for your appreciation and um, and and thank you for the work that you're doing too, because you're you're doing this work as well. Um, there's there's so much to be done here, and it's not easy, and it's it's not easy to monetize, you know, and it's not easy to sure. make it a part of a big network and things just yeah. happen, you know. It's 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 uh it's it's a big life work so thank thank you thanks for this time yeah my pleasure thank you mick mick everybody is also in this book hope in the 2020s he's a writer in it his name's there somewhere there you go there you go check him out at mixsilva.com right yep yep i'm still there on there <laughs> there you go try to get up all right man that's our plugs for the end yeah yeah you gotta gotta put them in there <laughs> thank Be you well. again